Hey everyone, it's Susan Pierce Thompson and welcome to the weekly vlog. So um, I'm on location in my living room. <laughs> I usually shoot downstairs. Uh, but yeah, I have a video team and we're shooting videos today, tomorrow, the next day, lots and lots and lots of videos. I think 26 videos, including this one. I gotta shoot the weekly vlog. So this week I wanna talk to you about an awareness that I had in some writing that I did in the morning. I've been feeling really good lately. I just came back from a bunch of travel and I hit the ground running with my morning routine and just dialed it in. And I added something to my morning routine that's really working for me and it's writing. Writing on my like personal inner growth work, like, you know, really deep reflective writing. And it's because I've been feeling a little gunked up, like just, you know, I haven't done as much of the inner work during the last four and a half years of this whole bright line eating explosion that has happened in my life as I used to do, because I used to have more space, more bandwidth, whatever. So I was feeling the need. And so I just decided to carve out 15 minutes-ish every single morning, day in and day out, seven days a week to do this writing. So. It's been helping a lot. And the prompt that I was writing on a couple days ago was about my last use. So like, you know, I identify as an addict to many things and my last use and why it started and what the consequences were. And so because I'm an addict to many things, I was writing about alcohol drugs, cigarettes, and food all separately. Those are pretty much the four biggies in my life, even though I haven't touched a drink or a drug in almost 25 years, coming up on 25 years. Um, those are still sort of the core of my identity as an addict, and then food was by far the biggest, and cigarettes have just been a, a snake, like a persnickety snake in and out of the last, you know, whatever, since I was 15 years old or whatever. So anyway, I was writing about these. And I got to the part about food and I had this awareness. It seems to me that a break in the bright lines progresses and proceeds along three stages. The first stage is an accumulation of various risk factors like life just gets harder all of a sudden, right? The stress gets dialed up. So for me, it's things like travel or re-entry, coming back from a trip, restaurants, which tends to correlate with travel, but not necessarily, just going to a lot of restaurants, having a lot of NMF around, so not my food, um, which tends to correlate with travel and restaurants, but not necessarily, right? Like sometimes I'm at an amusement park or something and I'm just stuck in this environment um, where, you know, and maybe I didn't travel for that and maybe I didn't eat in any restaurants. Maybe I packed my food, uh, which I did. I just took my kids to Universal Studios recently and I brought all my food for the day. That was traveling. We were in LA, but, um, you know, there were no restaurants, but I was just exposed to everybody eating crap all day long, right? Um, emotional situations uh, in general. And then there's days that are like, not necessarily emotional, but they're just jam packed. It feels like I'm just like running from one thing to the next and I'm like scheduled in 15 minute increments all day long. Um, nothing hugely disturbing going on, but I'm on the run. Um, what are some other risk factors? For me, I've identified that any kind of fasting, although intermittent fasting tends to be fine, but um, you know, the fasting mimicking diet or water fasting or anything like that puts me at risk. Uh, what else? Not getting enough sleep puts me at risk. Not making phone calls to bright line eating people puts me at risk. Um, not having contact with my mentors, like my sponsor, um, puts me at risk. Uh, anyway, so an accumulation of risk factors. That's stage one. Then what happens, this is stage two, is the bottom falls out of my willingness. Meaning, I tootle along feeling really vigilant about protecting my bright lines. Like my identity is solid, I do bright line eating, I am this, I do this, I believe this, I feel this, I'm all over it. And then, 
usually without my knowing and my permission. It happens so subtly. I flip to thinking it would be a really good idea to game the system a little bit and take my comfort in food, just a little bit. Like, I could go out to eat tonight and I know this place and they just, their vegetables are a lot oilier and I, you know, or we're going out to eat tonight and maybe I just won't tell them to leave the dressing off the salad and bring me oil and vinegar on the side. I'll just have them leave it fully dressed, you know, or just, you know, usually it's little things or I'm going to this restaurant and I'm, you know, or like I'm home and I'm like, you know, I think I'm going to make myself breakfast sausage and hash browns for breakfast. Like normally I have oatmeal and yogurt and blueberries, right? But like suddenly I need, I need breakfast sausages for breakfast for my protein. So it's like, it's still bright technically, but I'm looking for a hit from food. And because I'm still on the bright side of the bright lines, it happens without my knowing but suddenly I've, I have a brain that needs a little comfort. Now, the way Everett Considine describes this is that when your stress bar gets higher than your support bar, the food indulger comes in to fill that gap. Like the part of you that wants to indulge in food is trying to make the day a little easier, a little nicer, a little more comfortable, trying to create some relief, to provide a sigh, just a little comfort in the day because it's gotten pretty harried, right? Um, and again, in Everett Considine language, um, I tend to get blended with this part, this food indulger part, meaning I don't even notice that I've slipped out of my highest self, that I'm not my calm, confident, self-actualized highest self. I've blended with my food indulger and suddenly I think it's I who really wants to, you know, I, I want to take my comfort in food. It happens without my permission. Then the transition from stage two to stage three is I do that thing. I take my comfort in food. I get lit up a little bit. And some percentage of the time, the result downstream is a relapse into full-blown addictive eating for me. The trick is it's not 100% of the time. It's some percent of the time. I don't even know what that percent is. Who cares? It's 15%? It's 70%? It's 30%? All I know is that for this gal who wants to be bright 100% of the time, whatever that percentage is, it's, it's more than zero. It's like some percent of the time I'm face down in a bowl of cookie dough and thinking, how did I get here? So I'm writing about this, stage one, stage two, stage three, and what I realize is I want to know what my risk factors are. I want to know what my risk rating is every day. So I created a spreadsheet and I'm using it every night and I thought I'd share it with you. So I tweaked it until it adds up to 100. So a risk rating of 100 would be off the hook. I'd probably be huddled in a corner with a gun in my mouth at that point. I don't think it's possible to actually have a risk rating that high. Um, since I've been tracking it, I think my highest score was 62 which is high risk. Uh, my lowest score was 12, just to give you an idea of the range so far. Um, I will say that on the day that I got 62, I used some sort of indeterminate multiplier to just uh, make the emotional situations line a high enough number to reflect how freaked out I felt that day. Like there were just, it was like, I talked to someone on the phone, she's like, well, don't you have like five ridiculously emotionally charged situations. So scoring yourself seven out of seven for that seems like not enough. There's five of them. So maybe it should be 35 <laughs> out of seven. And I was like, yeah, I think so. It's five times seven is 35. Cause I had five like crazy stressful things happening at the same time. Um, I was crying. It was like, I was totally freaked out. So that's how I got a 62 that day. But I've noticed, um, at least once, I think, I think I've only been doing this for a few days. This is like hot off the presses this week. I noticed that right after that day that was a 62 where I was all freaked out, the next morning I had to take my daughter Zoe and her five friends from her sleepover that night because it was her 11th birthday. Happy birthday, Alexis and Zoe. They had separate sleepover parties. This was Zoe's party. And I had to take her and her friends to Denny's for breakfast. 
and you know, I'm having two eggs over medium hash browns and a bowl of fruit at Denny's for my breakfast. And the voice in my head says, Denny's is gonna use small eggs. Those two eggs are not gonna total four ounces. You should order a side of bacon to have with those eggs, just to get enough protein. <laughs> I can't even say it with a straight face. It's true, that's what my head said to me. I think if I hadn't filled out my risk sheet the night before, I would have ordered the bacon. And you know, I don't know if that would have led to wild eating off plan in the next days or weeks or not, but I probably would have ordered the bacon. But I just filled out my risk sheet. And as my voice said that to me, my highest self clicked in and said, oh, but I'm really high risk right now. That bacon might not be a good idea. Maybe I'll just surrender to like a really clean breakfast this morning, get out of here alive and go home and like take care of myself today. And suddenly it felt okay to do that. I'm like over 90% positive that that would not have happened if I hadn't stayed aware of my risk rating from the night before. So I just wanted to offer these awarenesses to you in case they help inform anything you go through in your bright line eating journey. I know I'm not alone with experiencing stress going up, risk factors accumulating, and then the indulger comes in to say, hey, you know, how about you eat a little something to make this all feel a little better? But maybe I'm also not alone in like, not really noticing as that happens exactly. You know, like I, I, I think it's me that wants that extra food. And this process of like tracking my risk rating each day is helping me unblend from that part of me that thinks that food is a solution. Because the truth is in my life, food isn't a solution anymore. There are other things that are solutions. Honest conversations, good nights of sleep, bubble baths, journaling, meditation, calls with good friends, squaring my shoulders to whatever's really up and doing what I can to address it, praying, surrendering to what is. Those are all solutions. Bacon is not a solution in my life anymore today. So yeah, I offer this. Now down below, you'll find some links to, you know, or whatever. I, my team's putting together some stuff. I sent my tracking sheet and they're like, oh yeah, we got you covered, Susan, with PDF, well, downloadable, blah, blah, blah. So they got some stuff for you if you want to try using this in your own life, the risk rating tracking sheet. Um, I offer it as a tool. Um, I hope it helps if you like the thought. And that's the weekly vlog. I'll see you next week.